Here we go. Number 40. 36, I mean. 36. Okay, so we here's the key right in here. This is the information they gave us. So what it says is at 2, Uh, the output is 260.1. When the input is 4, the output is 751.69. We'll start there. So they asked for, based on this, this information, what's the 2-unit growth factor? What's the 2-unit growth factor? And so we have to know what a 2-unit growth factor is first. What does it mean? What does a 2-unit growth factor mean? Walter. Maybe, but that, I didn't ask for a calculation. I asked for what does the two unit growth factor mean? What is it? You want to try that? No. See, that, that's the key. If you know what things mean, then the calculations will make sense. It's, like, it's the one unit growth factor squared. No, but that's not what the two unit growth factor means. Sorry, that's a, cal that's a calculation. What does it mean? We've got to know this. When you multiply the other person's number by, you get the second number of units by the Okay, when you say numbers, can you be more specific? What numbers? Not necessarily. What numbers do we multiply a two-unit growth factor by? Outputs. Outputs are the function, right? It's a multiplier on output, and if it's a two-unit growth factor, which output does it give us? The next output. Is that right? No, it's not the next output. The next output kind of sounds like you're going how many units later? One unit later. So it's not the next output. Which output do you get with the two-unit growth factor? Two units advance in which? Input. See, this refers to how far the input advances when you multiply the growth factor times the output. So it's, it's the new output that you get for a two unit advance in the input. Got to understand this. It's the output that you get when you multiply the growth factor that according to a two unit advance in the input. So Walter has suggested that we take 751.69 and divide it by 260.1. Is that correct to get the two-unit growth factor? Right, because it, here we see an, a two-unit advance in the input, right? A two-unit advance in the input, and so it would be whatever this multiplier is to get that output. So to get that multiplier, you would divide. So you're going to divide 751.69 divided by 260.1 to get that multiplier. Okay. And what is that? What is it? 2.89. Okay, so if you're asked for a bunch of growth factors, I think it makes sense to get the one unit growth factor. So I, to me, it's more natural to, to uh, do C next. And then all the other ones get from the one unit. Okay, so now I've got the two unit growth factor. And I'm going to call the one unit growth factor B. So how can I use the two unit growth factor to help me find B? So how could I get the two unit growth factor from the one unit growth factor B? That's what you said, Omar. Um, yeah. Uh, just square root 2.1. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is the one unit growth factor B. How can I represent the two unit growth factor using B? The two unit growth factor would be the squared. B squared, right? Because to advance two units, you'd multiply by B, and then you'd multiply by B again. That would advance you two units of output. So therefore, B squared equals what? No, it doesn't equal two. It equals two point eight. It equals the two unit growth factor. And you want that to be 1.7. Okay, so that is, put that in red. So the one unit growth factor is 1.7. So let's talk about the half unit growth factor. What's that? Yeah, so, so you know, call it C. If you're not sure, call it C. 
What would you need to do to the half unit growth factor to get the one unit growth factor? Squared. If you squared the half unit growth factor, so times the half unit growth factor, times the half unit growth factor again, that would be equivalent to the one, one unit of input change. So then C is 1.7. So notice, if the one unit growth factor is 1.7, the one half unit growth factor is 1.7 to the? One half, the square root. Uh, is it like 1.03 or something? No. What is it? 30? 303? Yeah, so that's 1.303. Okay, so how could we have also, we could have also gotten the one half unit growth factor looking at these two values, right? Because what's the advance in input there? One half, right? And so how could we use those two outputs to get the one half unit growth factor? Just divide the outputs, right? So you're looking for you're looking for the multiplier that would take you from that output to that output, or one half unit of input later. So that divided by that should also be that same number, whatever this is, one point three oh three. You said. Two point five unit growth factor. So we can start with the one unit. So yes, so you just think about how many times would you have to multiply 1.7 together to advance 2.5 units of input? Two and a half times, right? So this is 1.7 to the 2.5. And then what about the five unit growth factor? So the power of five one unit. Take the one unit growth factor, multiply it together five times. What is exponential growth about? Repeated multiplication of the, we talked about the one unit growth factor. So if you want to advance five units ahead to the output that's five units ahead, you're going to multiply by that one unit growth factor five times. That's what this is all about. Okay, initial value. So the initial value, does it correspond to x equals one or x equals zero? Make sure you got that. That's a big common mistake. Students want to say, x equals 1 is when you get the initial value, but it's 0. So what are the coordinates of that point right there, our initial value? What comma what? What's the x coordinate? 0. And then what we normally call that number? The initial value a, right? a is our normal, normally what we call a. So we've got at 2 units, or at uh, x equals 2, y equals 260.1. So how can we use our growth factors then to figure out what the initial value is? So how many units are those apart? Yes, two. two. Therefore, how does the two unit growth factor play into that? So what calculation can we set up if, we, if we've got an output of A and then two units later we have an output of 260.1? What calculation can we set up? So it's in order to solve for A. Omar. Okay. Uh, basically, try to solve, uh, put the function as in uh, P for initial, and then to the growth factor 1.7, and to the power of 2 equals 260.1. And then try to solve for the initial. Okay, so that's a different way of doing it. That's a, that's a valid way to do it. But we can do this without setting up the function. Yeah, come. Okay, so if, if multiplying by the two unit growth factor, what, advances us two units, then what would take us back? Two units, dividing, right? So, so yeah, so 260.1, if you divided by a two unit growth factor, you'll get, what, the output two units earlier. Okay, another way to say that, see this is, isn't our initial value A times the two unit growth factor, which was what again? Isn't that equal to 260.1? So there's another way to think of it. To start, if you start with the initial value, if you were to multiply that by the two unit growth factor, it would give you the output two units later. Boom. So A equals 
And that's, that's where this division comes, right? 260.1 divided by 2.89. So A is 90. Uh, function. So now the function. So f of x, initial value, 90 times growth vector, 1.7 to the x. Questions on 36. Does it, those who ask for it, does it help? Okay, so the, this this particular homework, not all, you know, but this particular one is, is if you made a good effort and you had professional work, you'll get a high grade, okay? So I, um, I know it was kind of quick, and you might have had some trouble. All right, any more questions on this one? All right, so number 40. Why doesn't that work anymore? Okay, so it's asking us to figure out if it's linear or exponential, and then fill in the blanks and define a function. <clears throat> so um, what characterizes a linear function? So, so again, it, this, solving this problem comes out of your understanding of, you know, we spent a month on, or two or three weeks on linear functions, and now we're working on exponential functions. So hopefully your ability to solve this problem is coming out of your understanding of, so a linear function, what's that about? Christian? Repeated addition of the same value. Repeated addition. Is linear growth repeated addition? Todd? Or subtraction. Or subtra okay, or subtraction, right. Exactly right. So if you have repeated addition, that goes along with constant rate of change, like we talked about, right? For every, for every uh, certain, what do we say? For a change... For a equal changes in x, result in consistent changes in y. That's addition. That's addition. Equal change. So here's equal changes of equal changes of x of plus one. So here's like delta input, delta x. If we get consistent changes of y for those equal changes in x, we've got constant rate of change, and uh, we've got a linear function. So what is so let's test this out. What is that change from negative 10 to negative 7.5? Positive 2.5, is that right? So if this were constant rate of change or linear function, then every time we increase by 1, we ought to increase by 2.5, do we? Yep. Every time we increase by 1, we increase by 2.5. What is the value of the constant rate? Right? Delta Y over delta X. And since delta X is 1, well, then it's just our change in Y. Right? So this, we're talking the constant rate is how much Y changes for a unit change in X. Okay? So it is 2.5. And then to write the function, oh, so we're going to fill this in now. All right, so if it's additive change, then what happens if we do half of delta X? We're going to do half of delta y, right? So if, if we've got changes of 1 result in changes of y of 2.5, then if we take half, you know, constant rate of change is about proportionality of the changes, right? A constant ratio of delta y to delta x. So if you take half of the change in x, you ought to get half of that change in y. So half of that is 1.25. So adding 1.25 to negative 10 is negative 8.75, is that right? And so then these are all now half changes in x, so we're going to get half changes in y. And negatives, is this 0.25? Does this make sense? Constant rate of change because it's additive. So now the function, uh, remember our point slope form. We just get to, we just pick any point, pick any point that we know is on our our line, and we've got the constant rate already, 2.5. We got down here, so it's gonna be just plug in a point. So 2.5. So yeah, we worked hard in a couple classes to develop this. 2.5 times x minus. Just take the first point, negative two plus negative 10, or 2.5 times x plus two minus 10. So this is 
Table 1. Y equals 2.5 times X plus 2 minus 10. Questions on Table 1? Does it make sense? Okay, Table 2. So now we've got, again, equal changes in X, but these are by 2 now for the, for the given output. But even so, even so, if it was linear, well, we'd still have an equal change in Y. As we, or a consistent change in y for an equal change in x. Okay, so do we have that? Let's look down here. So what's the increase here? The increase of two. What's the increase here? Six. Not exponential. Or sorry, not linear. Is it exponential? If it's exponential, then what do you, what do we have? Squaring it. One squared is three. <laughs> Careful, don't multiply. It's right. It's, it's about you're not squaring the output. That wouldn't be exponential growth. You have a growth factor. Which growth factor is three? Is three the one unit growth factor? What is it? Two unit growth factor, right? It's the two unit growth factor. So in order to get these values in the table in between, what growth factor do we need? We need the one unit growth factor. So if three is the two unit growth factor, divide by two. So you just threw away all the other stuff you learned in the other problems. How do you get, so if the one unit growth factor is B, how can you write the two unit growth factor in terms of B? B squared. And we know the two unit growth factor, it's three. So B equals? Three to the one half. That's our one unit growth factor. Wouldn't the sufficient growth be squared with three? Yep. Yeah, because that's the same as a one half exponent. So then to get this output right here, how are we going to get this output? OK, we're going to need more people involved here. Tim, how are we going to get this output right here? Multiply what by three to the half? Um, I'm sorry, I missed it. Previous output, Previous output times three to the half because that's our we're going to advance one unit of input. So this is going to be point one 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 times three to the one half. And what about right here, Alex? How are we going to get that output right there? Right, so the previous output times the one unit growth factor will give you the next output. And this is truly the next output because it's the one unit growth factor. So we could fill that in. And then uh, here we go, we can write the function. Initial value. Initial value, is it this one right here? No, no it's zero. So that's our initial value, right? So it's going to be one times one unit growth factor to the x. Okay, which you might see this way, 3 to the 1 half x, so you have to be able to make sense of that. What is 3 in that case? The number 3 represents what? Aaron, what do you think? What does number 3 represent there in that function? Christina, what do you think? Is that the one unit growth factor? What's that? That's the two unit growth factor, right? So, so x is one unit at a time, so we need to divide um, by one half if we're going to have the two unit growth factor as our base. So either way, so you can do the one unit growth factor to the x or the two unit growth factor to the x over 2. Both give you the same result. Okay, does that help on that one? Is that better on that one? So yeah, so when you hear linear growth, you think, oh, constant rate of change. So we've got all our stuff about constant rate of change, or 
additive growth on the output, right? Additive growth on the output. When you're exponential growth, exponential growth, it's uh, multiplicative, right? So it's the, each mul output is multiplied by your growth factor to get another output. Okay, so let's. Where is, Okay, so just to review here, centerpiece of exponential growth are growth factors. Who can tell me what a growth factor is? Jared Smith, can you articulate what a growth factor is? It is the number that you multiply the previous output by. Okay, so the number you multiply the previous output by to get the next output. So a multiplier, that's right. So first and foremost, it's a multiplier. It's a factor, it's something we use to multiply. And he said, multiply on output to get another output. And now we have lots of them, right? So, and uh, we specify how far in advance in the input we want when we multiply the output by that growth factor, right? So four unit growth factor means that the input advances four units when we multiply the output by the growth factor. Okay, what stays consistent from output to output? Who does? What stays consistent in an exponential growth? That's true, but what else? So when the growth factor stays consistent, what else do we have? What kind of change do we have? What's that? Percent change stays the same, right? Percent change stays the same as opposed to constant rate of change where the amount of change stays the same, right? The amount of change stays the same, okay? And so then we know that we can rewrite growth factors as one plus um, one plus the, that percent change, and that percent change as a decimal, right? So if the percent change is negative, we know we get a growth factor less than one. If percent change is positive, we get a growth factor greater than one. Okay, so let's talk about, let's work on um, some more on percent change. Now that we have all these different growth factors, now we can have a conversation about uh, percent change. So when I say growth factor here, so that's um, synonymous for either, growth factor or decay factor, okay? So, so that could be either one. So if the one unit decay or growth factor is B, then what is the three unit growth factor? Let's see, Nadine, B cubed. <coughs> Why is it B cubed? Uh, somebody knew. Shola, why is B cubed the three unit growth factor? What does that do to the power three? What is that about? That's it, right, yeah, and so if we want to advance three units, we're going to multiply by B times B times B, and that'll get us forward three, right, forward three, exactly. Okay, so what's the 10 and 16 unit growth factors? So easy, right? B to the 10th and B to the 16th, okay? And now we're talking about partial unit growth factors, okay? So we can talk about advancing just half of unit of input, and what would we multiply it by in that case? B to the? Power of a half, we saw a couple examples of that, right? And if we wanted to go a fifth of a unit or an eighth of a unit, b to the one eighth, b to the one fifth. So the point here is that these growth factors are easily transferable. If you have one, it's very easy to get another because we know how it works, right? So these are very easily transferable directly. All right, from each growth factor, so, so the question is what about percent change? How can we then do, do we have a, a direct transfer of percent change? So we know we can get the percent change if we have that value of a growth factor. We know we can get percent change from its corresponding growth factor, right? Piece of cake. But then the question is, do we have this easy transferability that we had with the growth factors? If you were given one percent change, could you? How could you find another? All right. So this is what we're going to investigate here. So let's do, do it, use an example. 
So uh, suppose that the one unit growth factor is 1.25. Okay, so I want you to find the three unit growth factor. Go, so find out what that value is. Okay, Brooke? No, I'm just asking for the growth factor, three unit growth factor. 75%. Is that the three unit growth factor? What's the multiplier? If, if B1.25 is your one unit growth factor, what's your three unit growth factor? Alec? He wants to cube 1.25. Yeah, that's it. And you get 1.95. You get 1.95. Okay, so what's the percent change for one unit? Hopefully we got that, right? So we know that we could rewrite that as 1 plus 0.25, and that plus 0.25 gives us 25% increase. And what's the three unit percent change? 95%. Okay, so what about it? Is it times three? Definitely not, right? We clearly know. It's 25% times three is 75%. Okay, so it doesn't seem like we have this direct transfer. We can't just take the one unit percent change and say multiply by three to get the three unit percent change. So let's, um, let's talk about why is this? So why is it that when you, when you have a one unit percent change of say 25%, the three unit percent isn't 75, but it's 95%. Why is that? What's going on there? Jaden? But we don't get 25 times 3. We get 95. So is it 25 cubed? So we did 25 cubed. That gives us 95? But I'm asking why isn't the percent change for three units seventy-five percent. If the percent change for one unit is twenty-five percent, what's happening? Well, you're, you're multiplying Christian. by yourself, not three. You're multiplying by the same number, okay. not three. If you multiply by three, you would get an additive growth because you're adding the same number over and over, rather than multiplying by the same number over and over. Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is it's like if you found twenty-five percent of your original amount, it would increase seventy-five percent if you kept adding that amount. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So what happens instead? We, we increase it by 25%, and then what happens to the new output? Is it, It's greater, right? So then what about when you take a 25% increase again? What happens? What's that? Take out. No, this is growth. This is growth. This isn't decay. Toss. Is it more or less? Right, because now the second time you multiply by 1.25, you're taking, you're, you're adding 25% of a bigger number. And so that's going to be a bigger increase. So you get this cumulative effect of always 25% more of larger and larger number. And so cumulative, cumulatively, you, um, you will be more than just 75%. Okay, that's an important idea. Okay, so... It looks like percent change, or, and it's true. Percent change is not directly transferable. Okay, we can't, we don't have this quick multiplication or division to get from one percent change to another. But you have a map. You have a map. So, for instance, if the one unit percent change was two point five percent, how could we get the sixteen unit percent change? Multiply by sixteen? No, but you have a map. So, what, how, where? How can we follow the map to get there? So we've got the one unit percent change. What will we do? Jonathan? What's that? One point zero two five. What number is that? One point zero two five. 
That's the one year growth factor. So you're going to find the one year growth factor, and then what? And then you're going to raise it to the child. To the what? Not qubit. I'm just 16. Sorry. Right. So, so the math, I wasn't actually looking for calculations, but what you're saying is correct. So we're going to find the one unit growth factor, and then we're going to find 16. 16 unit growth factor. And from the 16 unit growth factor, we can get the 16 unit percent change. Do it. <coughs> Okay, who's up? Let's see. Who wants to do it? Go for it. Okay, so I always want the process, not the final answer. Which is? Good. Power 16, which gives you the? Yep. Agree with what you did? Doesn't make sense. Okay, so it's all about, so getting from 1% change to another is about using growth factors. You have to use growth factors. Yeah, Alex? Um, what if you start saying a three unit uh, percent change and then you want to find the three unit growth factor? Oh yeah, I got lots like that too. Huh? Wait, if, if you do the three unit percent change and you want the three unit growth factor? Yeah, would you, instead of having that one half of three, add a two unit percent change or would you still be a one plus like your Okay, so um, so let's let's just do another example. Any more questions? That it'll, we'll see something like that. So, any more questions on this example? Okay, so here's another one. There you go. If the three unit percent change is seventy nine percent, what's the one half unit percent change? So, what is this saying? It's saying that if you advance the input three units, the output will increase by seventy nine percent. So, what will you need to multiply an output by to get the output three units later? There's nothing different. But what I'm asking is that one remains there, so when you put the one in front of your uh, percent change. Oh, yeah, yeah, did you forget we did this at the beginning of the, the module, right? So how do we get from percent change no, to... No, yeah, no, I, I get that whole part. What I'm asking is that if it would still be 1 plus 0.79. Or, just, or you would have just, to just just look, here, here. Seventy nine percent is the percent change. What's the growth factor? It's the same thing. Okay, so you keep that one. It's, it's irrelevant. If seventy nine percent is the percent change, then what's the corresponding growth factor? Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alright. So what's the roadmap? Just what's the roadmap? Patrick, tell me the roadmap on this one. Uh first you find the three growth factors. Good. Right? Which is one point seven nine. Right, you want to do it too? Okay, great. Oh, I think that's great. That's what I was going to suggest. Good. Okay. How'd you get that? Good. Okay. So we take the one unit growth factor, which is 1.79 to the one third, and raise it to the one half. And now let's get that. Let's get that value. What is that? Okay, and?
Understand? Like what he did? Cool. All right, so now it's a little trickier with decay. So let's practice some decay. So if the one-fifth unit percent change is negative 1.8%, what's the 10 unit percent change? So here's a decay problem. It's a little, there's a little more to this, okay? We've got to really know what are, how to get these decay factors and what they mean, okay? So roadmap, first of all. Diana, what's the roadmap for this one? Not any calculations, just a roadmap. Which now? Okay, so like this, that's going off road. So what do you need to do before that? So you're saying from the one, right? And then, and get the one unit, okay? And then we're done. Percent change. Okay, so that's the roadmap, but be careful. Right? Decay is different, a little trickier with these percent changes. See how you do. Okay, so let's see how we did. You got a question or you want to do it? No. All right, so how did you get the one-fifth unit growth factor? One-fifth unit growth factor is you took one. Yep. And uh, subtracted 0.08 from the initial from it until it gave us the decay factor Okay, let's stop right there. So what does the number, so is that, do you agree with that? 98.2? Yeah, 98.2. Is that better? All right, so what does that number mean? So this is a decay factor. We've got to really be, you no. Know, so it's kind of like we got 2% floating around with decay, right? It's like it's like this, this percent change, but then there's this 98.2. So what does that Decay factor mean, Brian. What's the meaning of that number? That's like how much you have left of the number you're Yeah, right. So you multiply this by the output, and the new output, that will be the new output. So it's what you retain or what you still have, right? It's what you keep. It's how much you keep. Okay, so Hamid, take it from there. So we got the the fifth unit growth factor. How'd you get that? The power five, right? One fifth. We need we need to advance five one fifths, right? Five one fifths gets us to one unit. Okay. You want to take this to the power of 10. Agree with that, everybody? So that's our one unit growth factor. So now we need the 10 unit. Okay. And did you get, so did you get a number? What'd you get? What number? Anybody? I got 40. 403. 403. So now, what does that number mean? Every 10 units, 0 0.403 means that? He's saying, he said we keep 40.3%. Agree? That's what the decay factor is. It's the portion you keep, right? Okay, so then what's the 10 unit percent change? It's going to be what we lose. So you take 1 minus that, or rewrite this as 0 0.403 equals 1 plus P. 
and that will be our percent change. And so you got negative 0 0.597. Is that right? So the percent change is negative 59.7%. Question? Could you have done the one fifth percent change, or sorry, go back into the 50? Yep. It just, it's always nice in a situation to get that one unit because that's, that's the easiest to transfer from. But he, what he asked was, could you do 0 0.982 to the 50th? Yep. Yeah, because there's 50 one fifths in 10, right? So to get, to, if you wanted to get 10 units advanced and you knew how, what one fifth was, you'd do 50 of those, right? 50 one fifths would get you 10. Okay, another decay example. Good on this one? Okay, here's the last one. So if the one half unit percent change is negative 34, how much is the one eighth percent change? So you can take, you can uh, include the one unit decay factor on your stop, on your journey, or not. If you if you feel confident that you don't have to, that's okay. I always prefer to find the one unit along the way. So this would be my route. But if you want to go straight from the one half to the one eighth, if you're confident, you can do that. Joe, you want to do it? Did you get it? So tell me, what did you do first? First, I used one. Okay, you got it? I got 6.66. 6. 0.66, and that, what number is that? What does it mean? That means the 0.5 unit percentage. The what? 0.5? <laughs> You're gonna raise it to the to the what? Are you, gonna, are, you gonna, are you doing this? Or are you gonna go straight? To? No, I, I go one unit first. One, one unit first, okay? So it'll be this to the two. So he's got the one unit decay factor at 0.66 squared. Agreed? And then? Eight or one eight? No, no. One eight. Okay, and what we got? What number do we get for that? Anybody? Just shout it out. Nine zero one. And so our percent change is negative nine point eight nine percent. Okay. Questions. So now the question is, given a, just a written problem with about percent changes, you don't have this chart right in front of you, can you? Okay, so, so we just had a rounding error along the way. So, yeah, so maybe it's because of the, yeah, so it's just someone, someone had a rounding error. All right, so here's kind of same idea, but deviating from our actual chart. So if the one-year percent change is 9%, what's the one-quarter percent change? Go. The one-year change is 9%, what's the one-quarter percent change? Corey, did you get this one? Still doing it. Tell me, so what was your first step? Yeah. Good. One year growth factor is? 1.09. And then? Good, which is? 
Square it to get the one quarter. So that's one quarter of a year. One fourth. And what do we get for that? 1.0? 225? 218, is it? Yeah. <coughs> okay. What's the one quarter percent change? Same thing, right? So you're going to find use growth factors to make the transfer and just know how to get percent change from a growth factor. Questions on this one? Okay, we're going to use that value later. So remember, and I'll remind you, okay? So one more. What about the one month? Okay, so if the one year percent change is 9%, what's the one month percent change? Okay, who's Walter? Want to try it? Uh, yeah. So it's one point zero nine. One point zero nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just stop right there. Tell me what that is. What is that? What you just? What is that right there? Is it a percentage? It's a growth. What is that right there? Jared, this Jared. Okay. The one month, right, the one month growth factor. And what do we get? 1.0072. Percent change? Or what, what is the percent change? 0.72%. That's a percent, not a decimal. 0.72, less than 1%. Okay, so same thing. Change your percent change to the, to the right growth factor or decay factor, and then transfer by through the decay factors, growth factors, get the corresponding percent change. All right, so now this gives us, sets us up to talk about something called APR, annual percentage rate, which is a bit confusing, okay, because it's different different than what we just did. Okay, so here, here's, here's the thing that will, that will be hard to, um, hard to absorb. So try, try really hard. It's often used with loans and investments. It's not the one year percent change. It's called the annual percentage rate. So it sure sounds like the one year percent change, but it's not. It's not the one year percent change. Many of you will try to make it the one year percent change. But it is not the one year percent change. Okay, so you hear this like with loans, like car loans, 1.99 APR, right? 1.99 APR, or with an investment, okay? So let's investigate. What then, if it's not the one year percent change, what is it? Okay, so we just did this, right? If the one year percent change is 9%, then the one quarter percent change is 2.18. That's what we got, right? So now, if you had an APR of 9% with what we call quarterly compounding, then the one quarter percent change is nine divided by four. This is exactly what we said not to do, right? You, so you're taking this percent, this whatever this means, this, this APR, and to get the quarter percent rate, you do divide by four. You chop it up into four equal amounts. So this, this, for this first step, when you're dealing with APR, you, you you break the rules. You break all these principles that we were just talking about. Okay, so practice. So if the one year percent change is 9%, we got that the one month was 0.72, right? Mm -hmm. So now find if the APR is 9%, find the one month percent change. If the APR is 9% with monthly compound. So 
So you should have done 9, what? Over 12. 0.75%. Okay, so uh, I, was, I wasn't really sure what the motivation for this was, but I learned it in my first class. Um, the reason they did this was for before we had computer technology, it, was, it was made it easier for accountants, right? It was just an easy way to start, okay? So it made it easier for accountants when they had to you know, do everything by hand in the book, okay? And so, um, yeah, so we'll talk more about it, okay? So remember that the APR is not the one-year percent change. So let's figure out what these would be now as one-year percent changes. So um, here's, we've already done this. So you begin by finding the percent change per compounding period by straight division. Okay? That's how you start. Once you have that number, okay, once you have that percent change per compounding period, then... So there it is. So then, once you have that, then all our old exponential growth principles apply. So you only do this, you only kind of break the rule on this first step. And then from there, now we're going we're gonna to use these values, starting with 2.25% or 0.75%, oops, um, to go from there. Okay, so what's what the one-year percent change for the APR scenarios above? So we've got a 1% quarter change of 2.25, and now your experts, given that, find the one-year percent change, given a one-quarter percent change of 2.25. That's what we just practiced, right? Same thing. If the one-month percent change is 0.75%, find the one-year percent change. So we're, we just practiced that for half an hour, right? So we should, should be good at that. Okay, so we got a one quarter percent change of 2.25%, and we want to find the one year percent change. How do we do it? Anna? Okay, you want a growth factor out of this. Good. What are you going to, what's growth factor? Is that the growth factor? Okay, so yeah, one plus that. Okay, good. So that so which growth factor is that? Quarterly growth factor. Keep going. That's the one quarter a year growth factor. And what does that give you? Not not a number, but what thing does that give you? One year growth factor, good. Cool. And then? Let's do one more decimal place. Nine, three, one. Okay? Or that, that's equal. Keep going. You're doing great. That's still the one-year growth factor. What do we want? We want the one-year percent change. So how do we get the percent change from that? But you can actually with this you can just see it. What what is the percent change? Just nine point three one. Okay, so notice an APR of nine percent with quarterly compounding means that your true one year percent change is not nine percent, but nine point three one percent. Okay, so if you're investing your money in the bank. Yeah, right. We like this, but if you're if you're if you're doing a loan, 
They just they got you, right? So, so they got so no. So, so here's here's the deal. You got to know when they offer you some APR on a, on a car loan. You need to know what this true what what true percentage they're of interest they're charging you on that loan. And this would if you wanted the yearly percent interest, this is what you're truly having to pay in interest. So they did it that way because it was accounting. Yeah, so before computers it would it made it made for accounting really simple by starting by just dividing. Yeah. But that's the only time you break the rules is in that initial division. From there on out, notice we we did everything we practiced today, right? Change the growth factor, change the percent increase. Okay, so what about this? Anyone got this next one yet? Nina. Right? And we change that into the growth factor. Which one? Yep, okay. For one month. One, yep. So, one tw so I'll call it the one twelfth year growth factor. Okay. And that would be 1.075. Try again. 0.0075. Right, okay. Keep going. And the next week we change that into the one year growth factor. Okay. Good. And we got a number for that. Anybody? One twenty zero nine three eight. Three eight. Sweet. Okay. And then you're gonna want to get two percent from that. Mm -hmm. And you do that by subtracting one okay. from that number, and you'll get point zero nine three eight. Uh huh. And that would be a nine point three eight percent change. Okay, so the, here's the here's the deal. The, so what is compounding? Compounding is when they're gonna at the end of the month for this particular scenario they're gonna calculate that interest of 0.75 percent, and then they're gonna put that money in the account. And then at the end of the second month they're gonna calculate that interest and put it in, in the account. So the cumulative effect of a 0.75 percent increase every month results in a yearly increase of 9.38 percent. But if you do it every quarter, if you first split by four and do every quarter, then the cumulative effect is 9.31%, right? So the more that you compound, the more your interest can build on the interest, okay? Again, so if it's an investment, you like it, right? So, and if it's a loan, right, you're paying more. Are most loans like that, the APR is always going to be lower than the actual one year percent change? The, yes, it will. All, when you do this, you will always get a higher. What we call this, the one-year percent change, will always be higher when you when you first cut it by division and then and then uh, figure out kind of back calculate what the actual percent increase is. Well, it's not if you're the investor, right? Right, Dave. So say I want to find what the actual APR of my truck is. So I like if they have twenty-one point two percent. But the, the, the APR is the number they give you. APR is always given. You know, you never figure out the APR. It's always they always give it to you. Okay, so this this is this is called the APY, annual percent yield. It's the true one percent increase. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So So it depends. You have to read the fine print. So you have to know what the scheme is, right? Because just knowing, look at this, just knowing APR 9% is not enough, right? Yeah. It depends on how it's compounded. That then will determine, the APR along with the compounding determines then what your true percent increase is per year, or your, your true interest rate, like the, this is like the true interest rate. So we just need to get out your loan papers, and it'll be very, you know, it's, this is what's called like the truth in lending disclosure, because it seems, it's, it, especially when you have a loan, there, there's a, a, one of the papers in the big loan package is called the truth in lending. They have to let you know that, yes, it's this APR of 9%, but really what you're, the interest that you're being charged is this other amount. Okay? That's one of the things you sign when you buy a house and get a loan. Okay? All right, so can, we, can I erase? We good? Okay, so that, what we were calculating is called the APY. That's the true percent increase for a given APR and compounding scheme, okay? 
So that true rate of return, the true percent increase, is called the APY, annual percent yield. Okay, so let's just, we'll practice one. So here's another one. So if we were compounding semi-annually, that means twice a year or once every six months, twice a year. What's the APY? What's the true percent per year if your APR is 7.5% compounded semi-annually? So what's the first step? What do we need first? Who's paying attention? Morgan, do you know what we do first? Okay, all right. Nadine. Okay, so remember that what was the first thing we had in order to get the APY was we needed to get the, the rate for one semi-annual period. And how is it that we do that? How, this is where we break the rule, right? You're going to divide by 2. So you're going to start with the 7.5% and you're going to divide by 2. That's called the per compounding period rate. And so what is that rate as a decimal? Let's do it as a decimal. What is it? OK. And so as a decimal? Yeah, let's just try that. 3.75. OK. 3.75%. So now we've got the per semi-annual rate. And now we follow the rules, right? We, we, we follow our principles of exponential growth. So what do we do first? Growth factor, which is? And then? So this is the semi-annual growth factor. We want the yearly. So square it. And what do you get when you do that? 1.0? Therefore, the APY is? So 7.5% compounded semi-annually is the same as a true percent year, yearly yield of 7.64%. Good, yeah, so, yeah. Any questions on that? Yes, sure. We had already done that. Remember the quarterly? It was 9%. What was the first thing? We, we, set, we started with the 9, and we divided by 4, and that was the 2.25%, remember? So we started with this number, which is now this number, right, for this one. And then we worked it back up to a year. And then we did 9 over 12, which was the 0.75%. Um, sure. Sure. Compounding. Okay. This is semi-annual, so it's twice per year. So we're going to take that yearly rate and chop it into two. Oh. And now that's what you truly make every semi-annual period. So we're going to follow the rules now, because we know we truly make that much per semi-annual. So that's what we'll get per annual. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So we started with nine percent. We start by saying that monthly rate is for sure going to be 9 twelfths. So basically, you start at 6 12, and they say quarterly compound, and it'll be like quarter of, a 12, quarter of a year. Quarter divide by 4. Yeah, divide by 4. Well, let's just do another one. Okay, how about this? 4% compounded weekly. Do this. 52 weeks in a year. 52 weeks in a year.
So what's the weekly rate? That's what we start with, the weekly rate. Who's up? Malin, how do we get the weekly rate? Do you know? G, how do you get the weekly rate? We have 4%, now compounded weekly. So we, what we need is the weekly percent increase. If, that, if we have an APR of 4. Any idea? Con. Well, that's the growth factor divided by 52. We need the rate. So, so, so it's just going to be 4. It's just going to be the 4 divided by 52. And what do you get for that? 0, 7, 7. Okay, now that's a percent, right? Because I took the 4 and divided by 152. So then we need the weekly growth factor. 1 point. Zero 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 seven seven, and then so that's the <coughs> weekly growth factor. We need the annual growth factor. Raise it to the fifty-two. Just take that number, take the unrounded number, and just raise it to the fifty-two. One point zero four. What? It better be bigger than four. It's got to be bigger than four percent. So one point zero four. Zero eight. So percent increase is the APY. So you know you did it wrong. The APY is less. Yes, the APY will always be greater than the APR. Okay. So what's